Welcome everyone. This is the first um, uh, financial risk meeting for this new training and um, we have a few apologies which I'll just uh, cover now but we, what we're going to do before we do that I'm going to open with a uh, and I've asked Pamiti to do that and then I'll um, add a few other comments. Thank you Pamiti. <laughs> Recently, as, as you're all aware, we've had uh, Cyclone Gabriel come through. Uh, and it's caused devastation throughout New Zealand. It's caused us problem here as well. And there's been lost in life. I'm just going to ask the Mayor just to give an update and just in, in recognition of those that have been involved. Thank you, Councillor Research. Um, well, I'm, I'm going to be. We have stood down our emergency operations centre but and switched to recovery mode as, a, as an organisation. Um, but we still have around 200 households who are without power since last Saturday, Sunday. So you know, for many people across our district, many uh, farmers across our district, uh, they're still very much feeling um, the effects of Cyclone Gabriel and the uh, incredible challenges that come with not having power for two weeks. Uh, so I'm, I'm happy to say, though, that um, we are very much in still providing welfare across our district in this space. Um, Red Cross, I had a call with Red Cross yesterday and they've got a truck coming up with 30 generators to help out those families. Um, we have had a phenomenal response from across Aotearoa in terms of uh, providing assistance, which is always great. So I'm going to just use this opportunity to thank local government in New Zealand as well who started a, a, an Adopt a District scheme. So councils who haven't been affected were encouraged to sign up to, a, to be appeared with the council that has been significantly affected um, because people around Aotearoa are wanting to help, especially if they haven't been affected. And so I'm um, incredibly uh, grateful to um, Mayor Susan O'Regan from Waipa District in the Waikato and Mayor Gary Kusha from Waitaki District in uh, Northern Otago. Those councils have been um, with us and have adopted the final district. So we'll be focusing the uh, fundraising opportunities and any relief, both uh, organisational um, assistance too, that those two districts will be offering in support to the final district. So I'm incredibly grateful to Local Government New Zealand for this scheme that they've done and I know that we will also respond to the call should anyone else ever need it. Right now, I know we've got incredible devastation and loss of life further down south, but we still have communities that are really affected. Um, and so uh, it's going to be great to see that. We've stood up a mural relief fund um, for people to be able to apply to, and those, that information is available on our website or you can call through as well. And what I love about that is it's, it's a lot more flexible in how we can help people. Um, across our district, we actually only have one uh, house that has been red stickered um, is uh, been uninhabitable now. But we know uh, in the far north that we are very land rich in terms of our communities, and not actually not every property that has been affected probably exists according to council plans and things like that. So we still have families, we have farmers across the far north who are affected, but would never really know about that. So as in when and where we can help through the relief that we'll be receiving from our uh, um, from our <coughs> counties who have been uh, joined with us to help out um, from all the support around Aotearoa, we will be doing so. Uh, and I will be breathing out, uh, breathing out and probably um, be able to relax once I know that everyone has their power restored. Uh, and we're hoping, I spoke to Russell Shaw, the CEO of Top Energy yesterday, 
and hoping to see that done by the end of this week at the latest. So if you are fortunate enough to be watching this, then you are one of those Wano members affected. Um, we are still here to help and we need to come reach out and we need to do so. I also want to just use this opportunity quickly to thank the uh, to thank all of our own staff and our organisation. Sure. When the Emergency Operations Centre was stood up on the Friday afternoon here in Kaikuri, um, which seems like a lifetime ago now, uh, I am just uh, so privileged to have seen our own council staff just step into these roles, into these management roles, to ensure that we were as prepared as we could be before Gabriel actually tracked east of us along the coast but then the follow-up on from there. And I know that there will be a lot of learnings that we take from this. It's great to see uh, a lot of our uh, civil defence community groups are already uh, going through reviews of what they need, but where, where they need to fix up for next time. And um, while I know that no response will ever be perfect, I am incredibly proud of this organisation and the response that I've seen to date so far. And we'll be picking up on all of the gaps and all of the learnings so that we do even better the next time, because there will be a next time. Sure. Uh, so, yeah, I just want to um, thank everyone, thank our community groups themselves, our community head centres. Uh, I want to uh, thank um, our staff. Thank the support that we got. Uh, civil defence response teams from Canterbury came up here to help us out. Um, lines mechanics from the Lower North Island and from the South Island came up and are still here working and we are so grateful to and, and blessed to actually not have seen um, as significant the damage that has befallen those further south and I know we're going to be um, just a minute before shortly but things will get better um, and we're still here to help so please reach out. Mihiana, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tiffany. Um, like everybody else, too, I watched in horror just how big the devastation was when you, when you think about Hawke's Bay. But there has been a loss of life, and people are putting their life at risk, and just quite close to home with the uh, firemen and those that went out in the conditions like that. And so I think it's appropriate to just have you know, a moment of silence for those that have lost their lives. And I do know it's still ongoing, so I don't, we don't know the final figures there. So if we, we can do that, maybe we can stand for that. Councillor Anne Court and Councillor Pinatori Tiskovic. Uh, Happy to move, please. Thank you. And second, yep. please. Thank you. Uh, all Council. in favour? No. no apology. Sorry, I'm in fun. Oh, I guess you could apologise. Oh, sorry. And, and can we include Felicity on that, please? Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, just, just by way of a bit of a verbal update, some may be wondering what, what am I doing sitting here. As Deputy Chair, I've picked up uh, the role. We still haven't yet uh, appointed the Chairman. A Chairman of the Committee is something that the uh, Office of the Auditor General has said you should have an independent. We had an independent member and, and as you will know that work has worked really well. So we're scaling up essentially, we're going to have an independent Chair. So we're looking at somebody who's got uh, serious skills and abilities in this area so we can lift our performance in audit and risk. And if you looked at the recent, Gabriel, it seems to be quite appropriate in that sense, you realise just how much risk we're facing. And it's life and limb, and it's our infrastructure and so on. So, um, of course, we have financial risks associated with that, but just in ordinary business as well, we have a number of risks. And um, so it's important that we are 
you know, as as a as a wood and risk uh, team, we can function really well. Insurance and risk, I should say. So we can actually fu function uh, really really well and perform well. So that's the reason behind it. And hopefully, by the time we have our next meeting, we will have the new appointment and we can introduce him or her or whatever the case be. So thank you very, very much for that bit of pause. Um, and, and, and just let me say, I got an email from uh, a member in uh, a rate payer in Waipapa who has been associated with Cyclone Bowler. He sent me an email, which I'll pass on to staff, and saying we have a risk very similar to that. And you remember the floods of 1981 in Kirikiri? And that's in the Waipapa, which is under, which is being developed, and it's in the floodplain. So we have to be cognitive in our own area as well of just what potentially could happen. So just let me know. So we'll follow up on that. Maybe there will be a report on what exists there in the future, but it's not appropriate at this stage. There's no such agenda item. Okay, so moving on. So that's end of my sort of bit of a verbal update. So moving on um, to page five. Uh, item 5.1. If I can have a move and a second to uh, second it to do both ABC, which is receiving the concept yeah, council financial report for the period ending 31st December 2022, uh, and also authorise to receive a quarterly financial report going forward, and authorise to receive a monthly financial report through briefing papers, um, so that all the elected members can be informed of finances on a monthly basis. Uh, do I have a move a second, please? Happy to move. Happy to move. And second, how many of them? Thank you very much. Uh, any comments on, on that request? Well, yes, thank you. Oh, um, actually, just, just before I might be jumping the gun, uh, we'll take the, the financial account financial report of being read. But um, is there anything that you want to add very quickly that stands out? As a um, through the chair, obviously, in terms of income, we're showing um, higher order of income and contributions because of the external support we're getting from um, PGF, DIA, and various other entities that carried over from last year. Um, and in terms of expenses, we're also seeing some shift in external services because of the work that was already underway for the July and August weather events last year. So obviously there's more work going into maintenance in that space. Um, and the other one that it always stands out is the remissions, um, and we, we need to correct that going forward to time to the start of the year rather than in the clouds because um, we do do most of those remissions as the year runs. Thank you. Thank you, Janice. So, um, Deputy Mayor? Yeah, my question was going to be about the um, net operating position, and that is probably the, the position that we're in now versus the budget. Your comment about the con contributions from, you know, outside of council is probably why that um, number is not getting there. But what are we doing to manage that um, deficit that we're budgeted to have in net operating position? In terms of um, the year-to-date position being shy of... No, what, for, for the end of the financial year, um, what, what is our borrowing capacity going to be to um, shoulder that? Um, I think one thing you, you need to remember when we're looking at total income versus operational expenditure is that that total income will include capital grants. So whilst it's showing an operating deficit, it probably isn't a deficit in real terms. It will be um, PGF money or um, grant money that we've moved out as part of the process that we're going through for the annual plan. So operationally, um, I don't think we're in deficit. I think this is looking at capital. Um, I notice Matty's got his hand up next, so if I go to you, Matty, and then we've got um, uh, the Mayor and Tamati. Matty? Matty, I notice your hand's up. <coughs> yeah, I'm here to Councillor Radich. Oh, there we go. Okay. Oh. You do it again. Is the volume up? 
Can you um, hear me? We'll go. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, now I can. Yeah. yeah. Just just to page fourteen under renewals. Uh, renewal project for Lake Coria Hall. Now I could be wrong here. Didn't we give that hall to the community? And is there a responsibility now? Page 14 renewals. Renewal project for Lake Hall into the next financial year. Lake Hall in Taipa there. I recall we gave that back to the community and their responsibility, which involves finance. Good question there, Maddie. Maybe we will have to do a follow up on that. Um, through the chair, as far as I know, we haven't divested any halls to any community groups. So um, all of the halls remain in our ownership. I know there was, uh, as Mackie raised, and I do remember, there was discussion about that hall oh, specifically really? on that line, but I don't know the. It's the one um, that we did a consultation on for. Is it different, aren't they? Is it um, yeah. Okay. Is it different? Different? Yeah. In any case, you've got a whole year to figure it out. It's probably going to follow it up. Afterwards, we'll follow up that. Uh, yeah, just, yeah, just hang on, so, John. Uh, no, no, we're a bit, bit wrong here, um, Janice. Um, there were two halls in that area that we go back to the community. One was a rural hall, which ended up a disaster because that was, was so badly um, rotten, really. And um, Lake Hoya. Because in the last few years, we actually started giving balls back to the community because it was costing white bars a lot of money. And uh, so we made a decision, just give it to the community, let them sort it out and let them pay for it. And I'm pretty sure that Lake Coya was one of them. <coughs> yeah, we'll, we'll check on that. Um, yep. yep. Uh, is it Mal Malima, uh, did, did you... Are we going to respond to Matty? No, I think that's a hand raised to show somebody virtually has a hand okay. raised in the actual chat. It's only yeah, Matty. Sorry. Yeah, fine. I'll leave that to you then. So then going over to uh, the Mayor, uh, you had a question there. Uh, uh, thank you, Councillor Research. I just picked up on page 10 that yeah, income has not been planned for Tekua Waitanga in our Tekua Tekua revitalisation projects funded by the PGF as the milestones have not been met. Now, um, probably more general question is I'm aware that our uh, uh, public servants across all government departments um, following, and this was before the cyclone as well, uh, this was following uh, anniversary weekend flooding, um, have all been tasked with looking back over the projects that they are managing to see what, where funding can actually be cut and where, what projects can be put on hold or that central government will no, no longer fund. That makes me nervous for our own projects. Now, ones that are already up and running, like, obviously I don't think that we'll see those fall, but ones that haven't progressed significantly, I just see huge concerns around the potential for us to be losing funding. So if, if staff could just give a commentary around milestones and around what risk we have in the potential to lose some of our central government funding in these places and how we as governors, what conversations do we kind of need to be having or doing and what can we do to ensure that we are ticking the box or putting pressure on where it is so that we don't lose anything in this space. Thanks, Mayor. That's exactly the question I actually had. So, so can someone just expound? This This is a risk committee and, and certainly what is, and that is a that is potential, potentially high risk, and that I've highlighted myself. So can someone please give, give a response to, to Mayor's request there? Um, through the chair, every project that we have an agreement with and beyond is in progress, um, to my knowledge. Um, we have to have um, achieved certain milestones in order to submit invoices 
Uh, I know in particular for the um, animal shelter, those have been met and the invoice has gone since this report was done. Um, we can follow up on the rest. Um, I don't think it's that we are not achieving our milestones, it's just at the point that this report was written, we haven't got to that point. Um, and obviously now we're towards the end of February, but we can certainly make sure that for the next briefing that we send out, that we cover the projects and we know where we stand. That would be, it's just the, these ones in particular, the White Copper Sports Hub in particular stands out for me because this council is looking to spend, contribute eight million dollars yep. to this project itself. And if we know we, just just a little bit of security in this space. There has place. been significant money spent between Christmas and now on that project, but I'm also get the team to check on that. Yeah, thank you. Um, Timothy and then, then Hilda. Oh, Kilda, still on page 10. Um, really about the animal shelter article that was in the front page of the advocate. Can anyone advise us? There was like major overspend, was that from, from the council? Or? Blatantly erroneous. Do you, can anyone speak to that? I'm not sure what the article <coughs> Well, we were uh, in the front page of the um, advocate, it was saying that the council spent something like $2.4 million on the animal shelter, somewhere around here, um, and uh, you know, way over. But the Southern Animal Shelter, the Melka, the old Melka um, Kennels um, property, that it, it stated in, in the article that we had initially budgeted 200000 and that the budget had ballooned to 2.4 million. And so, yeah. Okay. Um, I'm not aware that we've got an overspend. We're still within budget for, for that project. There was a comment made. So obviously I, I'm assuming that they would have reached out to the comms team because there was a message there that um, final district council had responded and there was comments made um, through Rochelle to explain that we were happy with the progress that was being made um, and that it was all due to the in initial um, building that was there. They thought that they were able to repurpose that, but it wasn't possible, so that had to be flattened down and the cost was more cost effective to flatten it down rather than to repurpose it. Um, and that's why the costs have gone up. But so, yeah, thank you, Councillor Hadawana. Uh, what you're identifying there is reputational risk, and that's certainly something that we have um, problems with. So what I would suggest that, that we make a note as well, and that's something for our comms in terms of our projects, that we uh, have better comms around that. Uh, Councillor Research, if I could suggest to start in this space, at our former council meeting, um, it was highlighted through our new parks and reserves bylaw that the wording was negative in that space and we've had a little bit of pushback from um, our dog organisations across the district that one of our uh, nah, our council newsletters would be uh, put to sharing comms in that space. I think that this could be something that could be added to that around where the project is at, um, what the budgets are, where it's going, what it's going to provide, uh, because it and yeah, it, it will help to be a response. Like, I mean, last thing you want to see is your organisation on the front page of any paper for negative reasons, you know, especially cost overruns. Um, so if we could get our comms team to include that in that, uh, in that specific newsletter that we know they'll be doing for us, that would be great. The yeah. um, it more or less said that $2.4 million was spent to um, accommodate 10 dogs and a, a major waste of FNDC money, so that um, probably needs a, a press re response too. Yeah. So can I just... Thank you. I'm going to call this one to close, but well, just to because get I was in. previously the chair of the regulatory and compliance committee, I, I can recall a lot more information around this. The um, and, and, sorry, Hilda, what did you? So dogs 
Look, we were on the front page previously for, um, you know, like euthanising heaps of dogs, and we were dragged over the hot coals over not looking after dogs while they were in our pounds. That's why we had to up our game, and we have had to invest a lot of money to meet the Animal Welfare Act. It's the Kaitaia one that we previously had, and the one that was, um, there was a really good facility doing it on our behalf, but the relationship did turn, you know, ended. Um, so we, we had to take it in-house, make sure that we are doing it properly under the Act, and, and the councillors of the last term did commit, commit to those funds. The article accuses us of overruns, and that's just absolute, you know, clickbait, it's wrong, and I, I can get why some of our new councillors might feel that we have just, you know, spent money on dogs, but we have to. We have a huge um, dog management, you know, problem in the far north, and we have to, when we collect these dogs, they have to be looked after. The staff well-being also has to be taken care of. That's why we'll take you guys for a look um, at the Kwaitaia one and the Kaikui one as it's finished so you can see what, what they look like. But Malka, yes, at the time it was bought and it was deemed a good investment, but it, was, it didn't serve the purpose to meet the needs of the Animal Welfare Act, of which we were failing badly in, and that's why we made these decisions. So, thank you, <laughs> Deputy Mayor. So, I'm going to call us back to the focus on the report at hand uh, because it, it was a reputational risk. I, I let us go off, if you like. But just coming back into the report on land uh, on, at hand, so specifically the finance report. Any other, just, just by, I have another hand up. Some of the concerns I've had, and I'll just raise it at this point, uh, um, Councillor McNally, I noticed your hand there, and that is. I had notes all through here and said, what is the implication? What is the risk? And I think this report needs to actually focus on that so that anybody looking at it, any, any member of the committee looking at it can actually get a, an idea of what does that mean three months, four months, or a year out, or at the end of the year. So that's, that's my comments. But I won't go into the details like what is the risk for some of these things. So, but that's just a general comment on how we can uh, perhaps get that information to the members in, in, a, in a better minute. So we have, um, did I miss somebody here? I have, I have um, I'll go to uh, Councillor McNally for comments, yeah. questions. Yeah. I'll go up. Sorry, thanks. This, um, this report is as at uh, 31st December, so we're 53 days behind the April, which I'm fairly uncomfortable with, and I'll, I want to talk about risks predominantly. If we look at the capital financial overview year to date, which is position as of 31st December, capital expenditure. Page, returns. sorry, page. No, I've got the graph, so it's, I've got, it's probably a page of the middle as well. 36.5 million behind, 22% behind as of December. The year end shows 39.8 million behind, 23% page. Now, if we look, if we look at the um, risk of that capital expenditure, and some of those are carried forward already when you go through the report. Back in December 2021, this committee talked about the climate change risk recommendations and they uh, identified major fighting frequency, effect on infrastructure, and the, the impact is large long term financial exposure and in investment. One of the specifics that was reported there direct risks to council physical and natural assets. Um, infrastructure be, may be exposed and vulnerable, Na natural assets may become eroded or damaged. We've seen all this. And uh, effect, meaning the damage of lost infrastructure, impacting on level service, community wellbeing, environmental damage, financial cost to communities and councils. Now that is here yeah, right now. If you go through the report, just page, I'll just take you page by page and just refer to a few things. Resources, <laughs> budget, we have to pay money back. Customers not meeting for not meeting statutory timeframes. Risk um, income not received from Waka Kotahi uh, might be more coming. This relates to July August 22, 22 storm. So approved for funding of design and investigations on the major work, and then once design approved, we're expecting more. Um, what's the timeline on that? And we've had another event since. We've had two since. Um, and then there's other income, balance of grant funding for Kawakawa sewage treatment plant frequency. There's a whole list of them there, goes over the page. Um, there's no dollar amounts, and I don't know why it's been stopped. 
If you go to central government subsidies, new works, income has not been paid for, this is a sports club, has not, milestones have not been met. Janice explained that may have been rectified now, and we're 53 days on. If you just go through this, the risks are massive because of the delays. Um, there's other contributions. Three water reform projects are over budget. What are you spending it on? Unsealed road metalling, sealed road resetting, drainage renewals, bridge and renewal program works behind schedule. You, we can't afford to be behind schedule, but that probably goes back to the capital spend being where it was. The uh, capital expenditure being 36.5 million, 22% behind as at the end of December. There's some other stuff in there that just seemed really quite weird, really, reading it. Staff related costs, the staff acting up. Does that mean they're acting in a role ahead of their current position, or is, are we talking about a naughty person? Contract fees, higher than expected, largely driven by multiple extreme weather events. Back to the list. These, these things, and the stormwater and wastewater in particular, is that stormwater infiltration. And then we go to stormwater asset condition assessments. Under budget, the contract was awarded in July and work has commenced. How far have we got? It just goes on and on. I just, I'm just gobsmacked um, that we're that far behind in capital works. It's just been added to ex the extrapolation of the costs coming are huge. While well, we might get some funding out of central government to um, impact it, the the preventative maintenance we require in a road net network is going to be back to reactive and unplanned, which is the first urban stormwater under budget. The costs are mainly back and unplanned, and the terminal will be used in here. Unbudgeted professional fees paid for infrastructure planning and consultants engaged for external funding applications. Why? And that was NTA. Um, but the capital expenditure in particular is really concerning. One here that caught my eye, um, Monument Hill Drought Impact Project is under budget and the bore headworks and works on the plant, plant treatment plant has occurred, it's been spent, but you can't, the project's delayed because we haven't got any approval. Why did it even start? Um, sweet water over budget, you know, another one. We've got plenty of water this year. What's our great drought mitigation with water supply? Would you like me to carry on? I think I'll, you might. I've got pages and pages of this. I think you might. Sure. It's just bloody horrific. Councillor McNeely, I think you made your point. In fact, you, mm -hmm. when I'm looking through the things I've highlighted, those are the things you, you're talking about, those are the things I highlighted as well. And that's what I meant about the reporters not giving you. It's actually crazy to me that it's, it's a pretty awkward looking uh, position that we that we in, should we say. In page 15, if you look at the under budget expenditure too, how high it is. So I think that's outside of this meeting to solve at this stage, well, but it's it does highlight it's, it's a not, risk. It is risk. Yeah, we are but, talking about this is a meeting that's called assurance risk and finance. Yeah. Give me the assurance that we're we're catching up, mitigate the risk, and then we can talk about finances. Our yeah. finances under this report here. I'm not saying don't raise it. I say it certainly should be raised in this report, but to solve it at this time here, we we, but, but we identified it, and, and thank you for that. I think we're identifying that we're in a, in a position. One other thing before you go on, it talks about renewals, pavement rehabilitation, head of schedule for the following period. What's the failure rate? That's yes. a risk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree with that. And, and, and falling behind the long term plan and, and, and all of these things is a, is a major risk. Before I go into, go on to Councillor Papa, um, any, any other questions there, Councillor? And, and the other thing is, I want it noted that either through a workshop or some action, um, uh, uh, Mr. Mayor, that we, we need to look at these things that have been raised today. And I think as we get the chair coming on, that there has to be a period where uh, they're going to have to be brought up to speed as well. And perhaps that's a good time where we can look at this in detail. Um, and, and then a way forward that can mitigate some of these risks. So, uh, Councillor McNally, did you have any other comments? So, thank you for that. I really do appreciate it. Well, so, the other risk that's been apparent, and we dodged the bullet with um, Gabriel going through, but is planning the planning. And once again, this is assurance risk and planning. It needs to be mentioned. 
is that um, I drove through around the Waipapa industrial area. The plan shows, the district plan shows light and heavy industrial. That area is a flat plain. Um, you can see most of the buildings have been built up. The road, the likes of Climate Lane and Kahikatara uh, Rower Road are, are actually the flood paths of those, and I've seen them. You can't drive a car through it when it's. So one of the one of the risks there is new planning the council is when the permits are issued, um, if the flood goes through there, if we got gable, we would we would be flooded there. So the the mitigation needs to be we need a retention dam in the headwaters of the Fitzgerald River, and we just need to have some minimum bloody build levels. <laughs> there. It may be there, but um yeah. concern. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Council. And that's what I raised at the beginning. Uh, the retired engineer who sent me that email was raising those things and in fact um, even ahead of the allowing the bill to go forward ahead of the um, new um, zoning coming coming through. So we'll put, this has all been noted I hope, it's been recorded so we can uh, look at addressing those and I think we'll have a of urgency in that. I'm just going to go now to Councillor Kappa who had his hand up patiently. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, Chair. Look, I, I don't want to to continue the conversation that uh, Councillor McNally has uh, initiated because the uh, uh, similar thoughts I have is, is, is within the draft here. What I just wanted to really say is um, that I support some uh, move toward a workshop in terms so that we can um, craft something between what we are expecting from a report so that the language and the, the information that we're wanting is, is um, made known to our, to, to our senior staff. And I mean, we're in now uh, the fifth month, and we've just gone through the long-term plans and so forth that we have inherited. So it, it also makes us aware of what is being established, but also what needs to be uh, put into place. Uh, I, I totally support uh, some of the points that uh, Councillor McNally has brought because the, the biggest risk that I see is our personal risk when we're out in the field and uh, a number of um, uh, criticisms that we will receive as councillors and we really need current information that's happening for now and the first one that comes to my mind is in, in the uh, capital expenditure around Ngākahu uh, Dam, which is something that we addressed very early this year, uh, Mr Chair, and I don't see any any um, address in this, in this document, which really concerns me. And we have brought this to the table before. We've asked for a workshop to begin that, initiate that discussion, and um, it's not seen yet. So I support what uh, Councillor McNally is talking about, but also uh, support the, the, the mention that you, you said a workshop is definitely needed so that we can craft, we can sit along senior staff yep. Yep. to discuss what are the real items that we can talk about and how it can be better utilised for our for the future and also for that we share. Yeah, thank you. Councillor yeah, Kappa, and you raised the, a workshop that we did agree we'll be having sometime in the future, but I don't know when that's been set just yet. So thank you for all of that. So any other, it's been a, I think that we, it, it's pretty fair to say that there's been a lot of concern around the table and there certainly are risks there, given the time we have, um, you know, what we're facing in the, in the times that we've seen and experienced just recently. We need to look at that in a, in a more detail. Mm -hmm. Last, yeah. last Just question for, for, for you, you Councillor. Yep. You know, come a long way. I wouldn't mind even an hour session today before I go home. Yep. That's a possibility. I don't want to resolve anything, but just maybe have a little beginner session. I think, Councillor, you, you, uh, uh, you've raised a good point there as well. And what we were doing in the previous and just bear in mind that there is there's other things on today which makes okay. it difficult but 
Um, we did have a we did have a deep dive or workshop session associated with the meeting, and we can either do that before the meeting or after the meeting. I think it was after the meeting, if I remember correctly. And and that's exactly and given and that's efficiency because you know given the travelling and so on, it allows us to get down to some detail. Um, all right, so. Yeah, I just want to um, start by my little rant was more for the journalists, not at you, Fire Hilda, and our um, new elected members uh, regarding the animal shelter. But also, uh, I think um, elected members have raised a really good point. It, this is the first AF meeting. Um, some of our induction process is not complete yet. Um, I know some people got really annoyed with the way that my committee went, you know, I had staff introduce the report, so it would be really good um, practice to introduce the report, go through some of those images and narrate what, what it means and what it means for the ratepayers and residents. Um, that's just my suggestion and my closing comments. Thank you. Thank Jen. you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, so I'm going to call put, uh, and now put this to the vote. Thank you very much. As I said before, there are certainly a lot of concerns uh, and, and risks, and, and we can work through that. And, and yes, we do need better comms and just how we are with our different projects and what's actually there. One of the jobs, I should say, of the um, you know, we've got assurance and, and risk committee is to give that assurance that we are doing, we're on top of everything and doing the job. And, and that's what I'd like to be able to give to the public who are watching now, mm. is give that assurance. I don't feel comfortable with the report that we've got that we can give that assurance, but let me say that we are making a note to look at the detail, especially when the chair comes on board, so that we can in depth go through some of these things, which could mean setting, resetting or schedule, you know, scheduling things differently. But that's certainly the direction we're going in. So thank you. And at that, we'll just call this to close and put it to the vote. So we're receiving the report essentially. Um, so all of those in favour, we've had a move a second. Aye. Aye. Against. So carried. So thank you. Then moving now to item 6.1 on page 26. Can I move in a, in a second, please, to receive the report? Uh, the people uh, the capability and quarterly update um, report, please. Thank you. So, Deputy Mayor and thank you, Councillor Adewale. Okay. Do I have, I'd like to. I'd like to hear from. Are you going to question further? Anybody talking to us? You want to talk? Sure. Here we go. Do you want to talk to it? Uh, no, I'll have a question. Right. I'll take a okay. So straight over to Deputy Mayor then. Okay, just um, quickly, the numbers of um, people moving on seemed quite alarming, uh, but I've, I've gone through the last um, few years of uh, the same quarter and it's very similar. So I wonder if there's a pattern, you know, between the October to December period of where staff are either getting fatigued or, um, you know, there's something else on the horizon. <coughs> you know, have, are there any um, manoeuvres we've made to... <laughs> I'm looking at the staff. Are, are there, is there anything that we can do to, you know, get them to, to stay longer? And I, know, I acknowledge that um, council meetings and councillors can be a bit frustrating at times and the, the um, ebb and flow of decision making can be very frustrating um, but the, the organisation seems to stall and district services is one of them that each quarter over the last three or four years uh, for this period of October to December we've lost 10 staff in district services. <coughs> district services um, you know, that's a key component of, of our council and our, the impacts that we have in our um, communities. Um, so I don't know if staff can speak to what, what, you know, whether those, you know, what we can do around district services. But also, I'll shut that, shut down with just a reminder that um, this is for the staff um, below our CE. We don't 
the C is dealt with at ERC. Thank you. So thank you. Hey, Jill, Jill, if you can just respond, respond uh, particularly talk, talk us through the risk that we're facing. You know, they start obviously leaving. And what does it mean for that department? And, um, and just in response to the Deputy Mayor's questions there. So you, through you, the Chair, um, no, we haven't done any analysis on the October to December year-on-year -year figures. Um, we can look at it. Um, we obviously have got the analysis of the reasons people are leaving, and I can assure you it hasn't come through that it's elected member inquiries. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so that is something we can do. Um, district services in, in the old format was um, our largest group um, and with most um, outward facing, if you think customers, field officers, so probably one of those areas that you will see higher churn. Um, but we will continue to do the stay interviews, which um, we've just completed in one department, and we were going into district the um, another department in the old district services. So we'll review where, where we should put those resources going forward. Um, it now sits under delivery and ops. So welcome, Kevin. <laughs> Um, and we, we, we can do some analysis, um, but I think it will, we've only been doing this sort of reporting now. This is our second second year, so we'll only be able to go back two years. Oh, we're back so, to 2020. So. For reasons for leaving, sorry, and, okay. and more um, in-depth reasons and exit interviews and stay interviews. But, Joel, can you give us a, a committee assurance that the um, district services is able to deliver with the staffing it's got? Or the, Plans you've got in place? I'd probably, um, just because this report at the time, JC, you were the acting general manager, do you have any comments that you'd like to make? Through you, the chair, I, um, I do want to make a comment, <coughs> and that's largely around Bristol's consenting. So we've been through a period of time where our planners were actively headhunted by outside organisations. Mm. Um, we lost uh, quite a large number of plan planners. Um, Likewise, building, um, they were actively being pursued um, from external companies. So that's a large proportion of the people who have left the district services group. Um, we also had a couple of um, long-serving staff members who have been here for over 20 years retire. So um, it's not necessarily that the staff have been happy with, uh, unhappy, sorry, with um, council and money has always been a factor. Um, some of those companies came at our staff with phenomenal um, pay increases. So um, <coughs> that's, that's largely yeah. Yeah. why. And then, for your assurance, Sri Chair, I don't believe that we've got a concern around delivery in district services with our resources. And I think it is to note that one of our key partners, Kayama Ora, are the ones that just have, were tapping the people on the shoulders with it, uh, with the good, good yep. um, pattern. Yep, thank you. And I noticed the resource consent um, requests have been dropping, so, but I take it that, that you have, have it in hand in terms of... Yes. Uh, mitigation, how you can find and recruit new people, <laughs> and balance the workload. So I, I take it that's all been looked at and thought. Yes, about. interesting. That we've got um, ex planners now coming back to us. So oh, right. um, that's that's a that's a good news story. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from the members? <coughs> Look, you know, I, when I, I look at the, the data that's being presented, I, I can't help but, but think uh, in, in previous situations that I've been in, um, what's the projected plan for addressing these, these areas that have been identified as concerns? Because, and, and also the data, it's something that is it's not balancing. Because salary was one of the issues. And on page 30, we talked about the question was uh, what do you like least? And what do you like most? And for me, it was those, you know, you, you had team environment, you had those, those areas that I've identified. What's the <coughs> move to? I suppose addressing those areas, what's the plan 
if they need that, just on the uh, on the on the basis of the, the data that's being provided to them. That's the proposed plan. So through you, the chair, so may <coughs> clarify um, what's the plan around the least the least working at FNDC job satisfaction salary workplace culture. Mm -hmm. So um, with job satisfaction, we uh, do our engagement surveys, which we're due to go out again and do, so that will give us information that we can then review and look at. Um, salary is always going to be contentious for us. Um, just look at our annual plan figures at the moment. It's, it's a real, um, and when we're up against those um, businesses that have a lot of money, and I've just named one of them, the consultants, um, we, we we can't compete. Um, we do have um, for some roles we do pay market allowances for for a period of time to either get the skill in or retain the skill. Um, so we have done that for various roles. Um, but as an organisation, we we just don't have open-ended um, buckets of money. Um, and the workplace culture again through the engagement survey um, had actually um, increased. Um, and, I've, and we're aware of areas where we need to work on. I'm absolutely confident with this new group structure that um, we're in. A, we're in a really good place from a cultural perspective going forward. When is the next uh, review of this? Because that, this will be a good measure of what, what you're saying now yeah, for us to, to look at. This so is when the, is the next quarterly? This is quarterly. Quarterly. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, um, um, just on page 29, we want to start least right about working at FNDC, workplace culture. I'd like to, in the next report, or if we're gauging um, of some of these reasons why staff are choosing to leave FNDC, what is the workplace culture? What does that actually mean? Is it how the management team are running the kaimahi? For example, um, the district services team, or is it just a combination of what uh, JC has talked about uh, through career opportunity combined with salary and external groups, given them good reason to leave? Thanks for the good question. It's really, Chair, that is a really good question because um, you can tick a box to say workplace culture, but there's nothing underneath that says, yeah. can you actually explain it? So we can absolutely get that data going Just forward. Just expand on it. Yeah, absolutely. And through our engagement survey. Yep, yeah, thank you. Okay. Oh, I, I, I appreciate the data. Um, I am a bit worried that we're losing Māori staff from Te I think. Two or three. Since I've been here. So, yeah. All right, I'll put it to the, uh, the vote to receive the report. All in favour? Yes, there is. Item 6.2, can I have a movement, please? Um, to receive the uh, revenue recovery report. So, well, I'll move, do I have a second? Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, take it as read. Any questions, comments? Deputy Mayor, you're first up again. <laughs> Just um, with the statutory demands that are being, that were, application to the courts for financial assessment for 10 properties. Um, so one has been sold and another being sold in February. So the eight that are left. Are we confident that we've made um, verbal contact with these these people or you know, even done some door knocking because some people don't have phones or internet or power? Or, and, and I don't just mean through Cyclone Gabriel. Some homes don't have power um, when the cyclone's not in effect. And I just um, want to reflect on the example, you know, we had a couple of years ago where um, notice was being served on a homeowner but she was not um, uh, what's the word she wasn't in a place to take on that information so um, by miracle I was able to intervene 
but you know, so are there, you know, where are we placed with making sure that these eight that, or however many that could have their homes sold from under them? What? Sorry, my break. <laughs> How confident are we that this isn't going to happen again? Thank you. I was actually involved in that as well, and um, you know, exit job, job was done, mm, and mm. the person that wasn't in a state to be able to respond, as you say, without going into detail, and it would have been that the family would have lost that home, mm. yet it was, but it was resolved well just by that communication. So that, that's an excellent question. Can we have a response in terms of our processes and what we do there? Angie or Margaret? Through the chair. Um, this, this, so when we um, started with the um, legal proceedings um, and we received all these default judgments, we came back and we put a report together just to explain what would happen next. And we agreed that the next stage was going to be um, that obviously we would get um, judgment and we would put a charging order on the property. Um, then a letter would be sent to try and, and engage a little bit more. Um, but really the next stage would be, because once you leave it for six years, then that becomes statute guard as yep. well. And that, that, that is cost that we have uh, that spent um, to get this legal position, you know. Um, and so the decision was that for those properties where the uh, there was no resident owner, we would continue on to potentially look at a right to sell because we weren't actually selling someone's house as they were living in it. Mm -hmm. For those that were resident owners, the next stage would be is that we would get a financial assessment done through the courts. Mm -hmm. So the courts, because we wouldn't be able to know what people's earnings are and things like that. So they will assess to find out um, have they got cars, have they got jobs, you know, what kind of financial status have they got in order and will they be able to potentially pay for the legal costs, um, the rights, the outstanding rights, the judgment, etc. Um, and then once that would come back, that would then tell us, can they actually afford to pay it? You know, what, what is their affordability? Are we talking $10 a month, month or, or actual? And then we would come back to to then um, give a recommendation as to how we would to counsel. move forward. Okay. Yeah. So it's not a case that once we get it back, but I, I immediately go running out with my, um, then we will come back and basically give you an idea of, so this is what the situation is. Um, but obviously we would need to discuss, I mean, do we really want staff knocking on people's doors with... Uh, We're not legally warranted officers. No. So that would be the only thing I would... That would be a thought, potentially, that we'd need to consider, um, is, is to how we would... I know that you, you did, you know... Um, do we really want staff to do that? But yes, so we've gone this financial assessment. A number of houses have now gone through that sales piece. One of them due to be sold this month. So that means that we will receive back the legal costs that we have incurred as well, which is, again is great. Um, and so that then leaves us with a number of properties that are still inhabited um, by the owners, um, but we need to have an understanding as to how we move forward, depending on that financial assessment. Thank you. All right. All right. No other questions? Just yeah. It's good to know all this. Um, wouldn't we want to use sort of local social services um, in the case where people can't pay their mortgage? They probably can't pay a number of things. And um, you know, I'm just aware that um, if some so a relevant social services agency could make those visits, and you know, there's things like accommodation analysis that could assist in paying these debts. Mm -hmm. But people know about them. Oh, my question: Do we use? Thank you, Council. That, that, that I think is an excellent question as well. And perhaps that, in terms of us being proactive and um, before people fall into 
awkward hole, shall we say, if we can look at what services are around there. And maybe as, as we come up to speed, some of the, some of the new councillors that we have, perhaps it's a good idea to mm. just see how processes and how you know sure. some ideas that can mm. work through and solve some of these problems. So I'll finish with you, um, uh, Councillor Cup. Yeah. Cup I, I want to follow on from what Councillor uh, Walker just, just talked about because I, I just wonder whether there is an appetite, you know, for our processes to to be uh, robust and, and consider, uh, especially coming into you know, the, the, the awkward area of eviction things, whether or not they would uh, our system or processes would entertain the opportunity to draw on other services within the community mm. as a as a form of uh, what's that word? Collaboration. Collaboration, but also just reinforcing that our process was was quite uh, bold and robust, uh, and and this may provide a good uh, broader view for. You know, the whole community, and particularly you know, as I as I look at the movement of of every in, in area being involved in um, in in, in uh, purchases or, or supports like the social services, the health services, but also uh, there must be children there as well with education to be involved. As well. Thank it would you. be good to to entertain that. Thank you. Thank if there you. Was an opportunity. Yeah, thank you, uh, Councillor Cupper. The answer is actually we do, um, but and, and um, so again, I think that's a case of getting that, yeah. that communication out. The elected member, is that, uh, yeah, more elected member. Is, is, is that correct? Is there anything else you want to add to that? Um, from my seat, um, I think if you look at the processes that the team goes through now, post COVID, to where we were pre COVID. Um, they are a lot more um, supportive. Um, it is much more of a collaboration. We do refer people to budgetary services, and we do make them aware of the, the support they can get through MSD. Um, and we take every opportunity possible to get a payment arrangement working with them before we go near any kind of recovery action. Um, we did have. I think a limit on two years, but we have pushed those boundaries quite significantly where we needed to, um, particularly in the case that you referred to. Um, and sometimes it doesn't matter how we try to engage, we, we can't get the people to actually talk to us. Um, so the team is doing everything they can to be proactive in that space and to try and take the stigma out of the conversation of somebody having to have that conversation about why they can't pay. So it is much more of a collaboration now than it was pre-COVID. And we've kept that going, of course. Thank you, Janice. So kind of what... A point of clarification. Yeah. Um, are you meaning that they're not, they don't have people living in them, or they... Some do. The, oh. the ones that, are, that uh, we're referring to here are occupied properties. Correct. And the they're ones right. that we push through to straight rating sale will be the unoccupied property. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Anyway, I, I do think there's some really good points being made, and that's something that we both ourselves can get up to speed with the processes. And I'm um, um, looking at Councillor Bracken and Ian and saying that uh, the comms team, which I'm part of, is actually the answer to the information out there in the public yeah, as well. Sorry, that was my question. Who was it? Yes, it went to the other. Did you? Yeah, I was just that. Was, right. How's this being communicated across yeah. the district? So, yeah, has it been communicated? Um, communicated? Councillor McNally, I, did, I just just got put in front of me that there was a question from you. Yes, just looking at that um, couple of tables on page 36, 37, 38. Um, I was just wondering what the costs are. We don't, we don't have any indication of costs in there currently. And then uh, what's the recovery percentage? And I noticed that on one of the tables, uh, we've got rated debt there of over five years, 2.4 million. So this, um, what's the statutory timeline? That can be answered afterwards, but I just think that should be part of this report as well, please. So noted. So what you're saying is more information on the report there? Yeah. And, and, uh, and feedback to you. So I should you the timeline. Yep, thank you. So I'm putting it to the vote. All in favour? Um, right. Against? No one. Carried. Thank you.
Moving on to page uh, 38. And do I have a move a seconder? That's for the uh, report on the Rural Discretionary Fund, which we report on. I'll move for a seconder. Councillor Rafferty. Um, it's all there, it's pretty self explanatory. No comments, I think, questions? I have a comment, just that this, I was um, surprised because I'd never seen, I said on the previous Assurance Risk and Finance sure Committee and never saw a report like this come over the table. Mm. Um, so I did actually question why one was coming to this table. Apparently it was a part of the policy, it just never did. Yep. Um, for whatever reason, under Mayor Carter's um, mural ship. So the, I don't know what's happened previously, but we will be able to get these on the um, assurance risk. Our Tamil Middle Committee will have an update like this uh, whenever it comes across. Um, I will probably look into, because for the discretionary fund itself, a lot of it is we want to ensure that we provide um, provide transparency to our ratepayers, but also ensure the anonymity of people who do actually apply to it. Uh, so we've got a breakdown here, but what I'd probably signal is that it won't always be as detailed as you'd probably expect in a committee like this at times where we want to be able to protect the identities of individuals. Understood. Thank you. Thank you. Um. Through you, the Chair, um, you raise a really good point. We have to ensure, Carla, we have here that we're not breaching the Privacy Act by having this information in the public um, arena. Yeah, well, it's in the public at the moment. But I think I'm aware of that, so I'd, I would like to get clarification from our legal yeah. advice. That's not not, not right now, but. Not right now, back. yeah. And, and the Mayor's highlighted that, and that, that's critical. And given the mayor's discretionary fund, it can be quite broad in what it's done. It could be, for example, helping somebody that's got in difficulty, which is very specific. Then I think that, um, what, um, in this case, I don't think it is. These are all organisations, public-facing organisations, and so providing public services. So I think that's fine. But Excuse that's me, really through the chair, they're not. They're, they're individual people. Yeah, they've got names there. <coughs> yeah, true. So let's. Let's get that information, but it's been good. So put it to the vote. Oh no, I kept my hand up. Oh, sorry. Um, We've got somebody else as well. Yeah. Um, I noted and made contact with, I remember acting CE about this report because it didn't have um, the transactions, like it was from a certain date to a certain date. It, it wasn't an actual quarter. So I did ask for the transactions prior to the date of the report. And I'm just trying to find it. Yeah, that would be great, Janice. Um, Thank you. There was $1,043.48 to Bay Islands College um, in July. And in September, there was $1,000 to the Corrigara Marae Society. And then both of those transactions occurred prior to the election. Cool. Okay. Thank you. Right. So putting it to the vote, all in favour? Aye. 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 Against? Carried. Um, just, just by way, Mattie, I, I know I'm going through it, and, and, but just by way, you can signal uh, by comment on there, but I'd take it. You would have raised your voice if you were to do so. Moving on to 6.4. Do I have a move in a second? And this is for the. 6.4 page. It's it, page, sorry, page. So moving a second. I'm moving it. No why when I talk on that. So I hear that you moved it. And a second. Second. Oh, that was. Yes, great. So, as mover then? No, I didn't move it. I said I won't be moving. Oh, I didn't move it. Oh, who moved it then? <laughs> yeah, I missed that. Who moved it? I was speaking against it. I had status, so. You can't move it. No, no, no. Oh, sorry. So, definitely moved. Then, Councillor. 
cup up second. Bit. So, I think again, it's a lot of things I've here himself, but it's, uh, I think it's read. So, we'll begin with some questions. And first up again is the Deputy Mayor, and then we have the Mayor, and then we have. Um, Okay. So we'll have Councillor Deputy Mayor, the Mayor, Councillor Rackman, and then Councillor McNally. Okay. All right. All right. So, um, probably contrary to round the table, I am happy to see these reports. We've uh, we put in some changes in the statement of intent last year to ensure that we were getting these um, reports quarterly, was it? And final holdings uh, were, you know, not really holding back on on the information. We just hadn't asked for it. So now now that we have this, we believe it, it's good um, good governance of us to have this oversight of our council owned company. I don't have any questions specifically to the report, um, <coughs> you know, noting that it, there's been some improvements and they are facing some struggles, you see in the financial details there. Um, and I, I, I can see why some of those subsidies are happening on rents, but I, I do um, ask, you know, I see that is reflected in the is going to be reflected in the dividend that we receive on behalf of ratepayers, and so I do wonder why ratepayers should be subsidising these um, sub. You know, I see there's ratepayers are subsidising those people getting their rent relief if they are still, but it did say there were some more still receiving. Yeah, so I think as a council we need to decide whether um, that that should be continuing. Yeah, that's all. Thank you. Um, uh, Mayor, uh, what's next? Thank you. Yeah, um, echoing the sentiments of the Deputy Mayor, uh, I know that we have an upcoming workshop in this space, so I'd be looking to explore with Arnold's um, Holdings um, how they can come to the table when we're looking at the potential right now of a 12.1% rates increase for our new energy and how we help their books by paying quite substantial uh, leases for properties they own and then in actual fact I think that we might need to be getting subsidised as a way of um, bringing down our operational costs. But that's, that's not what I have to up with. Um, this report here, and I know that this is our first Timirumiro committee meeting, um, but this is probably just a signal to staff, but we saw it with the other one. The report left far more questions than answers, and also far more questions than um, and Councillor McNally's going to uh, prove, prove what I'm trying to say here is when we have stuff like this, we really do need to workshop these like papers like this yep. um, beforehand. That way we can come to a better understanding as governments uh, around where we're actually sitting. We can have staff present in the room, not in a formal live stream environment. We can have all of the staff um, who work for our group members there to, to be able to deep dive into a lot of this stuff. Um, that was that was just the point I was trying to raise. But if, um, I know that we are still, of course, we've had a couple of uh, workshop dates get put off for the crazy year that we've already had with um, X cyclone, tropical cyclone hail come through Waitangi week with the Prime Minister and all of Wellington up here and the Cyclone Gabriel coming through. So <coughs> it hasn't been an ideal start of the year in terms of getting into the emotions of our council and doing the side of the job that we have as governance for our district. But I would like to see us probably capture things like this beforehand so that we can have those opportunities to workshop. Thank you. Uh, 
So, uh, Councillor uh, Ruffin. Oh, no, mine was the same as the uh, other as well. Yeah. Right. Then I'll go to Councillor McNally if he's got some questions there. For um, us. Oh, my, my question is we're almost, almost five months late to this report. This is as of the 3rd of September 2022. And given what's been going on, I'd say it's completely irrelevant now. Um, I'd like to know now what, on the first page of the first quarter report, they talk about they're operating within their banking covenants with interest cover and equity to asset ratio. I'd like to know what it is now. Um, they talk about their, oh, on their, they've got their statement of financial performance. They don't, they show budget versus actual, but they don't show a full year. I'd like to see that. The debts are pretty significant. And the last point is when you look at their risk portfolio, which is towards the back of the report, um, they're talking about it. We'll be maintaining robust financial forecasts to identify potential exposures. And I'd just like to know the feasibility studies that were done before they started doing some of this work. And then they talk about the potential risk of um, a new council. I guess that might be me. <laughs> I wouldn't say that. You said it. <laughs> but I just, I just think it's five months old. It's time. It's irrelevant. Yep. So I'll be saying no. Yep. So thank you. That comments, no other comments. I can, I'm going to have a comment then. Look, I, 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 I looked at the risks starting at that point. And I thought the particular risk where they talk about the political risks and changes is a good one because that applies to central government as well. And that's always a risk. Um, uh, and, and if you read that text there, you'll see that they're talking about major potential changes that we're facing in, in, the, as, in, the, in the space of local government. And so I think they've done a good job of those risks that they identified there because I couldn't think of another one they should add there. But I, I, I take your point on board that this is out of date and that was my comment too. And um, and I might add that we, there was a business association event put on yesterday when we went up to the site and had a look, and it has changed significantly. So this is the other day, and it's quite positive the amount of changes they've actually done. I also recognise that there is a huge amount that they have on, um, and given the changes in the financials, over the, you know, which is outside of our control, you know, interest rates rises, I think we need to be on board on what risks that may be in the you know, potential here. So I'd say that um, going forward in the reporting, perhaps getting the additional detail you're talking about there, Councillor McNally, but, but the workshop, what the Mayor said previously, so that we can update, um, so we can get some confidence there. But also this, the Chief Financial Officer or the CEO come, is, is pres pre present when they do the um, and I've got one other question here from, from the well, Just looking at page 50 about uh, risk assessments, um, yeah, me and I can um, Pukatiti and Kaitai Airport, I sort of just really want to reiterate um, why the council needs to keep up with Waitangi Tribunal and um, Settlements and etc. etc. Um, Pukatiti, I have to say, I was a little bit for Kama that we even went that way. And anyhow, I, I, I'm really grateful that um, FNHL are a little for Kama themselves and, and, and see it as a reputational risk, um, given that Mr. James Henry was the one who led this claim. And also, um, there's a lot of flurry of activity for the Kaitai Airport from local Hapu Manai Committee and um, Iwi, who understand now that Kaitai Airport is also a, a real high necessity, uh, you know, for future civil defence operations in the far north, should we get cut off by all rain. So um, I think we're going to look forward to your coming uh, um, call and council for that. There has to be a lot of quarter or behind the scenes amongst the marae and stuff. But anyhow, I'll, I'll keep it short. So um, I just do appreciate them identifying those two risks 
hopefully, um, you know, when people come here and present their tape, I worry, you know, like we give them time, but, you know, there needs to be a time frame that these workshops that we follow on and, you know, not like, those are way back, over 20 years old, some of these things. That's what I get embarrassed about. So can we follow up with workshops to address stuff? Or even sometimes staff can say, actually, we could solve a whole lot of quarter of these some way that we can unhook ourselves out of some of these dilemmas. Because, you know, sometimes we ask to find the local government um, something or other to unpick the injustice, but we staff might whisper in our ear, well, actually, if you go to 12.6.GCD, whatever, you can do it that way and save us a lot of money. We know, Tora. Yeah, thank you. Good comments. Other comments? Well, I'll put it to the vote then. All in favour? Aye. Aye. Against. Okay. Oh. Against. Recorded. Are you there, Councillor John? Oh, yeah. Many. Just, I know it's just been put to the vote. I just want to mention about Kupi and Kaira Airport. And um, in regard to the terminal building, it's falling apart, it's such a thickness. And I got on the phone and told him, Sandy Knock, to see what the cause of the Kaira Airport. And he reckons that. He reckons that. Uh, Sorry, Councillor, can we, that it's been put to the vote, but can we, there is, okay. if I understand correctly, the Kaitai Airport, which you're talking about? But I'm can totally we put this up, Councillor Radich, at our Mayor and Councillor Ketchup? Yeah. Uh, following okay. this committee meeting? Yep. Excellent. Yep. And, and there is a follow-up that we are doing, so let's let's take it to the end. Thank you. Um, so that brings us to the end. Uh, wait, I'm just going to get the time. It brings us to the end of the public um, area. So now, can I move to the second one? Now that we move to the public exclusion. Second. So, second. Great. So, and for the reasons given there, um, I'm going to vote on that now. Go to the vote. Please. Aye. Aye. Yes. Carry. So.
morning to come on and uh, then we'll do a bit of a closure and then councillor um, Kappa is going to do. Oh, I just need to say this is.